uh, uh, all welcome from my side. Um, and, and can I start the meeting now? Can Renato or Irina? Yes, you can. We can start? Okay. Uh, then uh, indeed, uh, let's start. Uh, and let's start an exciting webinar on an exciting topic. Dear speakers, dear colleagues, dear viewers, uh, uh, all warm welcome uh, and thank you for joining our webinar organized within the European Parliament uh, in anticipation of the hearing of workers' rights uh, at Amazon uh, on the upcoming Thursday. Just to be clear, uh, if you want to follow this webinar uh, in Spanish, you should go to uh, the bottom uh, of your screen uh, and on interpretation, push Spanish. Uh, you can also push uh, uh, English uh, or no translation if you're both fluent in Spanish and uh, English at the same time. Uh, um, and let's say, I think it's high time that we have this hearing uh, uh, on uh, the workers' rights at Amazon. Um, because uh, in a way, I think you can say that in the view of Jeff Bezos, workers are a cost and they're not considered humans. He's not interested in their well-being at all. He's only interested in the numbers of his spreadsheets and his bank accounts. Amazon is rolling out the same formula everywhere, not only in the US, but also in the EU. Uh, and as a matter of principle, Amazon is hiring their workers on the most precarious contracts available to them. Zero hours contracts, uh, working via a temporary work uh, agency, these are their standards and they're squeezing their workers to scrape small margins on everything. So Jeff Bezos can sell his half a million toy boats. And then they are pushing it. Uh, Amazon is using technologies such as hand scanners to track the productivity of the employees to the second all of the time. And if you know, need to go to the bathroom outside of the moments that the computer allows you to go, you are being punished. Uh, and they deduct fines from your salary for no reasons. This kind of pressure is leading to workers peeing in bottles, trying to continue their work at the same time. Uh, and I'm sorry to recall these images, but this is indeed the daily reality for the workers. The expectations of Amazon, of their workers cannot be met without breaking health and safety standards, which is exactly what Amazon is aiming for, increasing the pressure on their workers so they break the regulations to, the, to work faster. Amazon is playing with the workers' health, stretching them out and wearing them down. And sometimes it even feels as if we are ending up in the middle of a spy and horror movie at the same time. Amazon has its own secret service and intelligent team dedicated to spying on unions and labor organizing. And if you are thinking of joining forces with your colleagues, they stand ready to keep you for doing that immediately. They set examples to other workers by firing those and who had joined a union. And this is happening in Europe right now, in Amazon warehouses in Germany, in the Czech Republic, in Italy, in Poland, in France, in Austria, Slovak, and Spain. And luckily, there are brave people standing up against this. And this year, we had strikes in Germany, uh, and uh, we had a very large one on the complete supply chain of Amazon in Italy. The right to organize and the right to strike are considered core European values and we need to defend them together. It's stunning that Jeff Bezos nor any other Amazon official is willing to engage with the democratic process of an official hearing in the European Parliament. 
This multinational is creating workers' rights, it's busting trade unions, it's disrespecting democracy, and we do not need what Amazon has to offer. I think we should say in Europe, we're taking a different road. Uh, as is concluded on the Porto Social Summit, we want to have quality jobs in Europe. It's also important that we learn our lessons quickly in all uh, European member states to tackle their scandalous practices of workers experiencing uh, uh, in Germany, Italy and Spain now already. And I'm saying this with a particular interest in mind because just now I heard that Amazon is opening a big uh, warehouse mid-July in Schiphol in the Netherlands, uh, in Schiphol Airport. Uh, and we have to stand ready to act every step. So I'm very much interested uh, in uh, hearing from you, Elisabetta, about your experience uh, and the solutions fighting these practices in Italy. And then later on, we give the floor to expert. But first, up to you, Elisabetta. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, thank you Agnes, and thank you to all of you. I'm really happy to take part to this uh, webinar and I'm looking forward to listening to your contributions. Um, in the AMPLE committee, I'm now just to present myself, I'm now shadow rapporteur for an INI report on platform workers. And we are hoping that the European Commission will uh, uh, you know, publish uh, a legislative measure on them, a directive by the end of the year, so that we can uh, deal with the new serious regulation of, uh, uh, you know, the impact of digitalization on workers uh, and of also interconnected with uh, some other important measures by the European Commission on uh, uh, artificial intelligence and so on and so forth. So as Agnes pointed out, we are very much uh, concerned and committed in, uh, you know, uh, strengthening the quality of jobs uh, of our workers uh, everywhere in Europe. Um, we are working on the implementation of the social pillar. We are happy that the social dimension of Europe uh, also in the response to the pandemic uh, uh, has been, uh, you know, finally a reality than only a theory. And so within this uh, social turn by European institutions, I think that uh, the working conditions uh, of uh, our uh, employees, of workers uh, all over Europe, of, of course, is a, a, an utmost uh, uh, argument which uh, has to be prior in the political agenda. So as for the Amazon workers in Italy, uh, we have uh, very recently, in ma last March, assisted in the first general strike. Uh, 40,000 workers took part to this uh, strike, so it was a huge event uh, uh, which had a very political and social impact in the public debate. And, uh, of course, I think that there are three main points connected to the Amazon working conditions. So the first one is uh, especially their rights and the lack of rights that these workers really uh, you know, are characterized by. So as Agnes told you also in Italy, we are very much impressed because it seems that some of them have to deliver uh, 180 uh, packages uh, per day. And uh, as Agnes uh, told us, uh, they, they, uh, there are basically no breaks for many of them. So some of them told me that it is really almost impossible to take a little break to eat or eventually uh, to go to, to, to the bathroom. And the, you know, the, the work in our amount uh, is really very high because we are talking, uh, you know, of uh, almost 44, 45 hours a week 
and uh, so the kind of pressure physical uh, psychological pressure which is uh, affecting these workers is absolutely uh, remarkable and uh, you know um, also there is also the problem of uh, the control of productivity so uh, is it fair that productivity of these workers uh, uh, is uh, very much monitored always monitored uh, by algorithm or platforms or whatsoever and uh, that it is it, that workers are evaluated by uh, you know algorithms is it uh, a fair uh, you know staff a fair thing that they can be fired through an app so really there is no humanization uh, in this kind of employment relationship and we have to ask ourselves if uh, uh, you know platforms uh, uh, can become bosses or <laughs> employer that with no human understanding of the situations so um, the second thing is the right to unionize uh, of course, in Italy, we have uh, basically three collective uh, bargainings and three uh, kind of sectors uh, which are uh, included, as in the other countries. So the transport one, telecommunications and commerce. So I think we also have to, uh, you know, clarify the, the sectors and the collective, uh, you know, and also the kind of collective bargaining that we are referring to, because uh, there is a mix of them, and uh, and also some of them are not completely applied. So this is another point. And the final point is, of course, the transparency of the algorithm for some of these uh, workers. That many of these workers in Italy are absolutely foreign workers so more and more foreign workers sometimes they do not speak the the language our language and so uh, they have to be informed but many times they are not at all informed so i think uh, we have to uh, really you know uh, work a lot on the regulation and on social protection of these workers of course the gig economy has expanded exponentially during the pandemic and now time has come to, to take uh, really a serious step. So the floor is uh, yours. I, I think Agnes, you are going to moderate. I'm Thank trying you. to do my I'm trying to do my best. Uh, uh, and I think we have three interesting stories to uh, listen to. Uh, and the first one is from Alessandro Delfanti. You are our, a associate professor uh, at the uh, uh, Toronto University. Uh, as I understood, but you're also involved in studying what's happening in Amazon. So can I give the floor to you first to enlighten us what you think is happening in Amazon at the moment? Uh, Professor Delfanti, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Agnes, for the introduction. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I, I teach at the University of Toronto. And I've been working, I've been researching Amazon, uh, in especially in terms of working conditions inside uh, its, its warehouses. Um, so, and I'm very happy to be back in Europe for 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 an hour, although it's only virtually. Um, so I'm Italian, but been working, I've been working in Canada for quite a few years now. So I'm going to see. I'm going to try and share my screen. Um, if you could confirm, if you see the slide. Um, yes, can, right? yes. Okay. thank you. Yeah. So, 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 okay. So, just uh, uh, first of all, this is the part of the results uh, where we're collecting information we're collecting for a for a report I'm writing with my colleagues Dilian Radovac and and Taylor Walker Walker for uh, a report on on surveillance at Amazon, which has been uh, commissioned by uh, uh, Uni Global. So I'm very happy that they uh, asked us to do this. So it's going to be an overview of workplace surveillance uh, at Amazon. So I think we can fairly say that Amazon deploys one of the most sophisticated and in intrusive systems of uh, employee monitoring that uh, the world has ever seen in a sense. So their technological uh, firepower puts them in a very unique position and also their financial firepower, of course. Um, I also want to stress that uh, although they, they didn't invent, uh, of course, employee monitoring, the, they're, they're, they're evolving technologies and, and deploying technologies at a rate that's 
uh, uh, sort of new in terms of our experience of this kind of phenomenon. Uh, in, you know, across the history of industrial capitalism, they're, they're really evolving this phenomenon very quickly. Um, uh, of course, workers do not have a choice. Um, so the surveillance systems deployed by Amazon are integrated with the very tools that workers need to use in order to perform their job. So they cannot work unless they uh, make themselves a subject of, of the surveillance system. Uh, they're monitored to make sure that they make rate um, so, uh, uh, which 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 means that to make sure that they abide by the increasingly increasingly unreasonable uh, rhythms of work that Amazon requires uh, of them um, to fulfill the promise of faster and faster delivery to consumers. You know, three days, twenty-four hours, two hours, maybe in some urban centers. Uh, so that that reflects into what's that, what happens inside inside the warehouse of, and for delivery workers, and these rhythms are kept up. Thank, also thanks to the surveillance system that keep, keep, keeps workers uh, in check. Uh, but there is also the sake of you know, reasons of political control, as was quickly mentioned before. Uh, so there is also Amazon's ability to use these uh, surveillance tools to monitor what happens in terms of the politics of its workforce. Um, and uh, uh, workers are well aware of this system. They may not know the details, but they're well aware that every single thing they do, they're being watched as they work for Amazon. Um, so, oops, sorry. Um, so I'm gonna start with a, it, it's gonna be a very quick overview. Of course, the time is limited. I'm gonna start with uh, a couple of examples of surveillance technologies being deployed inside the warehouse. So these gigantic uh, so-called fulfillment centers where Amazon stores the commodities uh, it sells. Um, so they tend to be staffed by, you know, hundreds or even thousands of workers. Uh, it's, it's the core business, I wanna say, of what Amazon does. Uh, I think we're approaching 1.5 warehouse workers at this point globally working for Amazon. And I think it's 150,000 in Europe directly employed by Amazon plus uh, all the subcontractors uh, and so on and so forth. So it's a major, it's a major workforce. So the main instrument of labor is the barcode scanner that also was mentioned before. So it's very similar to what you see in, you know, in you, you, the, the technology used by, by supermarket uh, uh, workers to scan the prices. So they, uh, you by, by scanning the barcode uh, on a certain commodity, uh, on a certain item, let's say I'm, I'm, I'm storing this cell phone, uh, uh, workers record the position of the shelves. So the system knows where the, this item is stored. And then the, the barcode scanner can tell them, go to ALX cell number 45 to retrieve this, this item. And then the, 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 the worker will scan it again. So the system will know that this, the, the item has been retrieved and will be eventually shipped to me. So uh, it's about recording the position of stuff in the warehouse, but it's also about monitoring individual workers continu continuously. So as soon as they start their shift, they, they scan their own badge. And by doing that, they log on to, into the system. Um, so the system knows that, that, a, that the, a certain barcode scanner is, is now uh, uh, you know, attached to a, to a single worker. So the scanner can track whatever that worker does. Um, so there's a, there's a software called ADAPT, Associate Development and, per, and Performance Tracker, which monitors everything in terms of uh, items stored or retrieved per hour. Uh, and and uh, so TOT, so-called TOT, which means time off task. So whenever the workers logs off the scanner in order to uh, go to the bathroom or, or go to their, their lunch break. Uh, um, this system is used to monitor uh, people's productivity and, it's, and this, the, the numbers uh, coming from their productivity are uh, contrasted with uh, a targets set by Amazon's managers. Uh, these, targets, these targets are not necessarily transparent, so workers can be told that they're they are only reaching 70% or 80% of their, of, the, of their team's target, whatever that is. So this adds pr pressure, of course. Uh, so this is the main, I wanna say, form of productivity surveillance. Uh, all, all other things pass through the scanner, especially uh, this form of sort of ideological control. So workers are continuously polled with questions such as, how do you feel about working at Amazon? And they better click on the, I feel great option um, whenever the, the system asks them the, the, those questions. Um, another technology uh, that's been introduced uh, with, the, with the pandemic is the so-called distance assistant uh, system which is a, a set of AI powered cameras that monitor people's movement in the warehouse um, and project onto screens that are distributed across the warehouse, 
uh, uh, images of what's happening in real time, and they um, th this system generates uh, green cir circles that surround a certain person if they are keeping uh, social distancing from other coworkers, or red circles if they're not. So basically, you see you see yourself in the screen, and you see how how you're doing in terms of keeping uh, social distancing. Um, so uh, very different uh, system uh, of uh, employee monitoring, if you wish, for very different goals. Uh, it's, we, we think it's a poor substitute for uh, this, the kind of safe and healthy workplace that Amazon workers have been asking uh, through their uh, you know, political mobilizations uh, during the pandemic. Uh, as we know, Amazon work, uh, fulfillment centers have been um, hotspots in many countries in terms of diffusion of the virus. Um, a different... Um, um, horizon, in a sense, is what happens after your package has been, your, your, the item you've purchased has been retrieved from the warehouse, packaged and sent to shipping, uh, then it needs to be delivered. Um, so Amazon employs uh, thousands of uh, delivery workers, either through uh, its uh, gig economy app, which is called Amazon Flex. So pretty much like Uber or Deliveroo, you just download the app and start working for Amazon, delivering the, the last sort of last mile delivery, so to literally dropping the package. Uh, uh, on on the consumers uh, um, uh, at the consumer's door, uh, and also sorry, and also third work work workers driving for third party contractors like you know shipping companies who are contracted by Amazon. So these workers are also subject to a system of surveillance. Um, so Flex and Mentor are the main apps used by Amazon to organize labor in, in, at, for for, the, for its gig economy delivery workers. Uh, it pretty much like other gig economy. Uh, apps, it monitors all aspects of the driving, uh, including the location, of course, the data on product productivity, how many packages delivered per hour or per day, like, like we were we, we, we said before. Uh, it even surveys the worker's phone usage, uh, so tracking uh, phone, phone uh, uh, calls made or, or text sent. Uh, so workers have reported this, this ads pressure uh, because it logs um, phone activity as infractions, for instance. So the app is another system that, that Amazon uses to track delivery workers in this case. There is also inside their cars, other AI powered cameras. So Drivery is a new video surveillance system that's been recently introduced by Amazon. Um, and uh, people working with through Amazon Flex have been asked to uh, um, um, uh, allow the installation of these cameras in their cars uh, or to lose their job. Um, so uh, it, it's it's basically composed of two. It's 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 mounted on on your uh, rear view mirror in your car, and it monitors both the road uh, in front of you and the inside of the vehicle. So as, as soon as you turn on the engine, and until I want to say I can't remember if it's five or ten minutes after you turn it off, uh, the system will will be will be working, uh, recording uh, um, uh, video material from the road and, and from your your you know whatever happens inside the car. So again, it alerts drivers to infractions like distracted driving if you're picking up the phone, for instance. It also rates drivers uh, depending on their driving habits and, and make, make, make that, that data available to uh, uh, Amazon's managers. Um, so another system of video surveillance. Um, so the warehouse delivery workers in the present, these are just you know, snapshots you know, from some technologies used as part of Amazon's surveillance system. Um, I kind of wanted to move to the future in a sense. So I wanted to present a couple of patents um, owned by Amazon for surveillance technology that may enter the warehouse or other workplaces uh, they run in the future. Uh, I've been, this is, um, um, I'm just gonna uh, stop a second to say that I've, I've uh, performed this uh, wide analysis of patents owned by Amazon, basically collecting thousands of patents they own for technology to, to be used to organize labor vis-a-vis uh, -vis technology for the consumer, for instance. So just a quick uh, couple of examples of technology that may or may not materialize in the future, but certainly technology uh, Amazon is, has invested money in, uh, in terms of at least uh, coming up with the idea and, 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 uh, and writing the patent and submitting the, submitting the patent. So number one um, is uh, a patent for a, a quote-unquote en 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 enhanced interaction system based on augmented reality uh, 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 an, augmented, an augmented reality headset to be worn by supervisors. So imagine you're wearing these like gog augmented reality goggles. Um, as soon as you look at a worker, the system uses face recognition technology to identify the worker, 
and then projects information about the worker on top of your natural uh, field of vision. Um, so uh, uh, this, according to the pattern, the kind of information that's made, you know, readily made available to the supervisor as soon as they look uh, as they as they look at the worker is uh, stuff like demographics, uh, um, uh, relations with other with other workers, uh, location or navigation path pass through the facility or status, uh, which is it's, it's unclear what that means. So basically, this is a technology that makes workers even more transparent to manager managers uh, and, and, and does so in real time. So this is one of the most interesting, I think, technologies that they are uh, 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 designing or maybe even developing. Uh, the second one is, uh, I think many people will, will remember this one. This, this one has been the news a couple of years ago. Uh, pretty much all over the world for, cert for cert you know, certainly in Europe was discussed quite a lot. So this is a wristband or another kind of wearable technology uh, that, that allows sensors to be, positions, uh, to be positioned on the body of the, of the worker. Uh, so in the case of the wristband, it, it analyzes the position of a worker's hand in space and provides tactile feedback in form of vibration. Uh, and this is used to track um, uh, uh, as you can see in the, in, the, in the last quote from the patent, the main goal, as stated, as, as stated by Amazon itself, is to monitor performance of assigned tasks. And those, but also, I think the, the second reason is to speed up labor, so to increase the pressure on workers. So, for example, as you are uh, moving your hand towards the shelf, so to store, uh, you know, this, the, my, my, again, my, my cell phone on a certain cell, uh, the system vibrates to tell you whether you're actually, you know, you're actually, you're actually putting it in the correct cell or not. Um, so you don't have to think about where you're putting it. The system thinks for you and just do the, the last, okay. the last, the last movement. Alessandro, um, can, can you come to a close of your uh, contribution? Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm almost there. Okay. Um, so just uh, uh, there will be many other examples, many more surveillance systems, uh, including heat maps. That Amazon uh, generates to sort of geolocate, so locate in, in, in different workplaces which workplace is more at risk of, of worker organizing, body scanners, all the workers have to pass through when they leave the warehouse to you know to, to, to check them for uh, theft. Uh, uh, doesn't 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 just affect uh, uh, workers, also customers are surveyed as they use Amazon's uh, uh, gadgets like like Alexa or as they purchase stuff on the website. And also the, 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 the company sells surveillance systems to uh, third parties like law enforcement agencies or even consumers. Um, um, I think the pressure on workers in, in terms to make rate is one of the, the main uh, factors in terms of impact on the workforce. They're also pitted against each other based on data about the productivity. And if you're precarious, you're hired to a staffing agency that of course means that you, you need to fight for uh, your, your contracts renewal. Uh, in a sense, knowing that everything about you is recorded and monitored. Uh, uh, because of these, Amazon facilities tend to have a, a much higher than average injury rates. Um, um, and I want to say that um, we will kind of elaborate on that later. Women and visible minorities can be even more affected or can be even more vulnerable to the to the impacts that this system generates and generate on work generates on worker workers. Um, and uh, uh, just to wrap this up very quickly, I think. Uh, the pervasivity and uh, the, the 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 widespread spread use of these integrated system of surveillance ends up being being a threat to workplace democracy. Uh, Amazon workers across the globe have been protesting and fighting the use of surveillance, especially for productivity and and, and political control reasons. And I think they deserve our support. Um, and I'm going to stop okay. here. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, indeed, I think uh, uh, I do agree. Uh, they do, do deserve uh, our uh, support. Um, uh, uh, let's see uh, how two of our European uh, confederations are delivering support to our workers. We've got with us uh, Oliver Rutger, uh, who is uh, uh, working at Uni Europe, uh, and also Livia Spera, uh, who's working at the European Transport Federation. Uh, uh, so, uh, Oliver first, uh, and then you, uh, uh, Livia, can you so tell us a little bit about what you're doing at the European level uh, uh, for supporting the workers of Amazon? And then last, I'm going to uh, uh, give the floor to Jose uh, Luis Arias, uh, who's talking from the Spanish perspective. But first, European uh, uh, Oliver, can I give the floor to you, please? Thank you. Agnes, and thank you also to the S&D group to organize this today. 
and really being instrumental in pushing the Amazon agenda, especially with regard to the hearing on Thursday. I think that is important that we really put Amazon in the center of the discussions today we have about the future of work and indeed the future of Europe in a digitalized, more AI-oriented uh, economy. Amazon for Uni Europa is certainly the biggest challenge, and challenge sounds always very nice. It's rather the biggest problem we have as trade unions, but also uh, for the European social model. We had our Uni Europa uh, Congress last month. Agnes uh, was uh, speaking there as well. And there I compared Amazon to the Borgs in Star Trek. That is those guys flying around in cubes uh, in space. Uh, some of you might remember. And instead of saying what they do, you will be assimilated, resistance is futile. Amazon's motto seems to be, you will be Amazonized, resistance is futile. Amazon is really like an invasive species here in Europe that wants to integrate all of us into its business model, workers, but also competitors and society at large. When I look at, at workers, Amazon sees workers uh, as robots, as extensions of its algorithms. Indeed, I think its definition of robots deviates from those of most people. Rather than wanting to make machines more like humans, Amazon actually has ambition to make humans more like machines. So the image is not really another science fiction uh, analogy like C-3PO in from Star Wars, not Star Trek, but a robotic arm at an assembly line. So that is really what they want. Not a human being who is a robot, but they really want to make somebody who didn't really have thinking and is just following a program. This comes very much to the fore by what we heard already from Elisabetta and from Professor Delfanti. Amazon's management regime is enabled by full-spectrum worker surveillance and algorithmic management. That is what we are facing as, um, as workers and trade unions at the workplace. We have to deal with this. The result, a pace of work that breaks workers' bodies, really literally, physically plus a surveillance regime that shields workers' ability to exercise their fundamental rights at the workplace as individually, but also collectively. Workers feel like they are always being watched because they actually are. It is even worse than the panopticum. I mean, you remember this, uh, uh, this image of, uh, of the prison where the guards are sitting in the center and you can't see where the guards are at looking at. That is Amazon, but it's even worse because Amazon immediately tries to sanction the workers if they do something wrong. So it's not only passive aggressive, it's very much active aggressive in terms of getting at the workers. From the reports advice we uh, had last year, we know that Amazon had a program to snoop on workers' Facebook groups. Agnes was referring to this. I mean, they are really doing this with secret service uh, methods. We know too that Amazon sometimes engages old fashioned surveillance as when it hired investigators, union busters really, to photograph and surveil striking Amazon workers in Spain. That is something we really have to, to see how we can deal with it. Our conclusion is Amazon's practices really demonstrate to all of us in Europe that we need to, need to update the rules we have in terms of labor law. We need to ensure that workers are not unduly surveilled or driven to impossible productivity quotas driven by algorithms. So we need more rules. That, and to do that, let's start with cracking down on the anti-union surveillance driven workplace at Amazon with meaningful reforms. So how can we basically make sure that we get workers' representation, independent representation into, um, into an organization that Amazon that actually makes a difference. So we need, especially from the European Parliament, and there, Agnes, uh, when I look back at uh, the proposals here that you are making together with uh, Dennis Ratke, I mean, is really enhancing collective bargaining coverage, and that also has to um, apply to Amazon, we have to see how we can actually aim it more particular on Amazon, because it doesn't work if everybody else basically has collective bargaining coverage and Amazon is the one who uh, stays out. So at the whole, what we are thinking is Amazon's behavior is disrespectful to what we have here in Europe, and it's totally unacceptable. When I look more uh, concretely at this point, we are not really sure whether um, Amazon's behavior is actually illegal especially under the GDPR and other European and national law. 
But I mean, if it isn't legal, then we certainly at European and national level have a clear reason to make sure that laws is changed so that Amazon is compliance in in the way that we see the European values in terms of the labor market of the place of work. Because I mean, what we're doing in Europe is not only law, it's not only regulation, it's a system of beliefs and what is good and what is bad that we hold. And Amazon is simply not accepting it. They basically say, we have our model and everybody else needs to adapt. So what we need to do, we need to define what Amazon is actually breaking down in terms of the rules. I mentioned some issues and uh, Alessandro did so as well, and then see how we can fine tune our rules that they can't escape. As Union Europa, and this is as European Services Unions, we are in particular concerned and alarmed what is happening. Amazon is actually a major player across many services sectors. It's not just the people in the warehouses. It's in the warehouses, it's in finance, it's in IT. They're thinking about going in care. They're in post and logistics, they are in finance. So they are actually at the center of our economy and really trying to get down. We as workers, really everybody in services is at the front line. And what Amazon is trying is to basically say, we do it all for the consumers. So it's all good for the common good, which is just simply wrong because they really try to screw the workers which are in the first place, the consumers. And we need to regulate Amazon. We have to make sure we need to close the loopholes Amazon uses um, uses to, to exploit workers and gain unfair competitive advantages towards their competitors. And that is really important. They are not only doing issues which basically drive down uh, labor rights and workers, they really destroy industries that are competing with them because others can't. So there's really this tax financial profit, profit advantage they have, which needs to be stopped. And there is a more concrete one on workers. And quite simply, if Amazon is too big to be regulated, then it's like during the financial crisis. If somebody is too big to be regulated, then it's of systemic importance. And then we need to think whether we need to split it up. It's as simple as that. So European rules, what we basically have built up in Europe over the last 50 years, can turn the table of Amazon. We only need to have the political will to do so. And if all of us, that is trade unions, competitors, society at large, but especially the European Parliament, the, the European and national institution want it, and we do our job right, then we actually can turn the table, as I said, and can tell Amazon that you will be Europeanized, resistance is futile, that we actually change them to adapt to our system rather than what they want, that we adapt to the Amazon system of Bezos. That is really what we want. And be very clear, Amazon is not there to compromise easily. They will throw into the lobbying mechanisms hundreds of million euros to get their way at all levels. So you have really a responsibility. And I think that's especially the S&D that you don't really get succumbed by all the money they are basically putting out there. They have the resources, they have more resources as many countries around the world, even in Europe. So we really have to be strong and decisive. One positive point, Trump is gone. So I hope uh, with Biden in the US, we might have a cross-Atlantic alliance, which actually can cope with Amazon. And I very much hope that Amazon is, you know, for, for a couple of years, for four years, we were going around and say, Europe is the last uh, uh, resort to fight Amazon because here we are actually capable of doing it because there they have Trump and capitalism. I don't want to have a change now that we basically need to look to America as a savior for Europe because we don't get our act together. So let's work together. This is today. Tomorrow we have uh, an event where you are also invited to here in Brussels uh, and across the world on Amazon. And then we have our hearing on Thursday. Thank you okay. very much. Thank you, Oliver. Thank you for also this optimistic note because uh, I think uh, we have to fight uh, uh, the fight and we have to fight it uh, together. Uh, uh, after Oliver, uh, I now would like to give the floor to Olivia. Uh, is coming. She's representing the transport uh, uh, workers uh, uh, all over Europe. And Livia, I also uh, I'd like to hear your contribution. Are you also optimistic or are you pessimistic? Are you uh, willing to put up a good fight? Uh, can I give you the floor, please? Thank you, Agnes, and thanks to uh, the SND Group and to Union Europa for this opportunity. Well, one thing is certain, we are determined to fight, otherwise we wouldn't be here. So trade unions are always ready for a fight. 
Um, but I agree with Oliver that this is the challenge. And when I say challenge, it's not in a positive meaning. Uh, this is the big fight that uh, uh, transport union and service unions and all the union movement uh, and, the, and the progressive forces in Europe will have to fight. Uh, because if we lose this, we have lost everything. This is something that will spread and is spreading all over our society. And uh, Oliver used the comparison with uh, Star Wars, Star Trek. I would use a comparison with Dickens novels. When you hear the reports uh, from our members about what they collect in Amazon uh, warehouses and among the Amazon drivers, it really makes me think about, uh, uh, about Dickens. And so um, what Amazon is using is in a way nothing new. They're using basically uh, uh, a labor relations system that is uh, uh, that dates back to the uh, 19th century, uh, but they are using this combined with the opportunities offered by digitalization, and so that's why it is so dangerous and it is totally out of control. And I totally agree with Oliver. Current legislation is not catching up. It's not. We have to. We have to catch up, and we have to catch up in the right way. Uh, because um, technology and uh, markets and business are moving much faster. So in general, we need to, uh, we need to speed up. Uh, but I think, uh, I mean, many, many things have been said, and I will try not to repeat them, but rather to complement. Amazon, as I said, is the problem, the biggest problem, but it's not the only one. Uh, as we speak, our uh, Danish members are working very hard on a very similar company that, by the way, risks to be uh, to be bought soon by Amazon. Uh, that by this will manage to get the, to get to the Danish market that so far was close to them. That is called Nemlik.com, and it's acting exactly on the same way. Uh, if you would see the pictures of what uh, they do in their uh, warehouses, the way they treat workers, exactly the same model, the same kind of uh, a way to deal with with the workforce than Amazon. So um, it, it it is dangerous and it's larger than Amazon. And I think that there are three three different ways, three different pillars that we need to tackle at EU level at the national level uh, on how to deal with Amazon. First of all, now everything is about the European Green Deal. Everything is about environmental transition. Um, uh, but uh, where where is it the Green Deal when we are dealing with this? Uh, uh, vans that are basically delivering uh, our parcels for uh, for no cost or for one euro maybe. So uh, there was an article a couple of days ago that in France there is a proposal to to prohibit um, to prohibit free deliveries. That could be a good way because there is not such a thing as free lunch, as free lunch, and um, the low cost uh, model in the river as the low cost model in any other sector comes with the price that is paid by workers. So that could be a very good uh, initiative. We are talking a lot about uh, boosting public transport, mobility in the cities. If we have the cities full of these vans delivering for, uh, for no money, no, no matter if we electrify, no matter if we uh, use hydrogen vehicles, there will it will always be a problem for urban mobility. So let's tackle this environmental point of view. Um, the second point of view is market competition, uh, uh, taxation that was already mentioned by, by Oliver. Are we tackling uh, the uh, monopoly that uh, Amazon is basically uh, um, setting up in Europe, uh, that is basically exploiting in Europe? Uh, the taxation that was already mentioned, I need to, to say this again. And then there is the core for us, of course, which is the social model, the social pillar. So um, it is about collective bargaining, and we honestly hope that the work that you're doing in the parliament will help to uh, boost collective bargaining. But it's not even about not signing agreements, because in many countries, uh, Amazon is signing agreements. If we take Italy, it's signing an agreement. But they do really the minimum. So industrial relations and collective bargaining goes beyond uh, negotiating pay. It, it's it's a, it's a much larger process that ne that is needed to negotiate health and safety, that is needed to negotiate productivity, that is needed to negotiate uh, uh, any other aspect of working condition. And when when you see that uh, when you see, for instance, that uh, they are doing whatever they can to not to have elections for works council for safety rats, um, 
when 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 the limits are really always pushed uh, uh, further and further uh, and when, when you see that Amazon in many countries does not even have an industrial relation department. So uh, when, when our members negotiate, they negotiate with uh, the legal officers. That means that there is, there is a structural lack of, um, of willingness from this company to engage. And there are some, uh, some other actors that we can involve in all this. Uh, Amazon has this tendency to always go to these remote areas, with a promise to bring jobs, but the only things that brings about is disruption. The, the local community communities are totally disrupted because the jobs that are offered are um, part-time, uh, short-term, so people can't really make a living out of it. Um, so at the end of the day, also all the local administration are extremely disappointed. They had rolled out the red carpet for Amazon, but what they get in return is very little. So, um, who, th there is really no benefit of Amazon other than for Amazon shareholders. So shall we have a discussion about, uh, uh, it was already said about the common, um, a common vision on, on, on what, we, uh, what, we, uh, we, what we can get out of it. And certainly the legislation that will come, that will come up later in the year can be a way to tackle this, but there are also other, other issues. For instance, um, light vehicles uh, that do international transport, as, as you know very well, um, we we'll have to we we'll have to use a digital tachograph from 2026. 26. Why don't we use this also for national transport? That can be a very good way to monitor uh, driving and rest time and uh, uh, regulate that uh, regulations are. Are, are very well, uh, are, are better implemented. Migrant workers is a major issue. Some uh, warehouses, uh, um, warehouses and, and, and some sites of uh, Amazon, they are hiring people coming from the same region in order to avoid that there is uh, any uh, uh, attempt to form a union or to, uh, uh, you know, to, 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 to make some progressive demands. Um, in some, in some countries, it's true, there were strikes and we are really proud of our workers in Italy, but in some places, people are scared. Uh, and we need, to, we need to tackle this. Um, it, it's time, it's not possible in 2021 to have, uh, uh, in Europe to have uh, uh, situations like this where uh, industrial relations are uh, de facto uh, blocked by an American company. Uh, liability in subcontracting chain. These are all very difficult things, but these are things that have to be put on the table. It's not possible that we accept that bogus of employment is spreading all over transport, but all over in general uh, 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 the, the, the economic sectors in Europe. Um, there, there are ways to uh, to prove that these people are not self-employed because basically these people are uh, are not uh, are responding to someone are responding to an algorithm that comes from a big multinational. So um, it, it's a very complex work. Um, we are as trade unions determined to cooperate. We are determined to fight our fights uh, as we are as we are showing. Uh, but of course, uh, there is a need for having. Uh, uh, really a change in paradigm and how do we see Europe uh, and how do we see the role of Europe. Um, it, it's very sad to say, uh, but if you want Amazon fits perfectly in the vision that the EU has, has promoted over the last decade about citizens as consumers and not citizens as workers. So as a consumer, I have the right to have my parcel delivered for free. But as a worker, I do not have the right to have a, a, a good working condition, driving and rest time, and so on. Um, it's a so it's a, again it's a it's a it's a it's a sort of a social Darwinism where only the strongest will survive in in Amazon sites, and we are observing this without doing much. So it's really time to act. And and I conclude. Uh, the, 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 the thinking, I think, what we, that we should have is what more uh, should the company do in order to push us or to push a decision maker to act? There's nothing more that, he, that they can do. So um, I, I hope this, this event uh, that are uh, held this week will really be a wake up call 
a collective wake up call for those who are uh, here to make decisions. And again, thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you too uh, uh, for uh, your uh, determination uh, um, uh, and uh, also for the call you're making upon decision makers uh, because uh, this is indeed what we are trying to influence uh, uh, here. Uh, I uh, have now, I will now give the floor to Jose Luis Arias, your representing uh, Commission Obreros, uh, the Spanish trade union. Uh, I hope everything will work, works uh, all right in translating uh, you from Spanish to uh, English. And, and, and please, uh, Jose Luis, can you tell your, uh, about your experience with uh, uh, Amazon workers in Spain? Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I want to thank the European group, the Socialist Group, for your invitation to speak at this event in which we exchange ideas and uh, our positions on Amazon. As Agnes has mentioned, I'm going to focus on the situation here in Spain, and I'm going to talk about my story as a, as a union leader in the fulfillment warehouses that Amazon has here in, in Barcelona. Amazon has one of the main logistics hubs in Spain. In a place called Prat de Llobregat, and there are 4,000 direct workers in that warehouse. Amazon also has other centers in Barcelona, Martorellas, Castel Bisbal, and the Barcelona metropolitan area as well. Barcelona, los centros que tiene Amazon, pues están the Amazon un centers here in Barcelona have in total about 5,000, 6,000 employees. In my experience in trade unions, I would say that, well, I've been in them since I was very young in the Spanish transition, in the first democratic elections that we had in this country. Back then, I was already a representative for the workers, so I have a great experience and trajectory in Comisiones Obreras. I witnessed uh, some <coughs> periods of time that were very tough in terms of union busting, but it is indeed surprising that in the 21st century I still see some things that I thought belonged to the past. Situations in which workers feel afraid, and I believe that this is not something that should ever happen. They should not be afraid of belonging to a union. And this is what we are seeing with most of the Amazon centers. In most of them, the workers do not have legal representation. Since 2008, we began organizing the employees here in Barcelona, Amazon workers. We began with a small hub where there are only about 80 workers. We managed to have union elections there, and Comisiones Obreras was the main representative. We had to do that sort of under the table. We were not able to access the, the place of work to organize the employees, but rather we had to resort to contacts, and the employees would come and visit us because they were willing and eager to organize themselves and change their working conditions. That was the first place uh, that where we managed to organize the workers successfully. 
nos hemos ido avanzando en la conquista de derechos y mejora de las condiciones de lo que se llama la cosa clara que aquí en España tenemos una negociación colectiva muy diversa. Tenemos una muy diversa colectiva. We have about over 50 eh, different types of conventions. We don't have a nationwide collective bargaining, but rather each region has a different way of proceeding. So we have to say that, yes, Amazon began uh, complying with the collective bargaining for the logistics industry in the area of Barcelona. And I have to say that Amazon has been complying with that. So what's the problem? that we encounter, and some of the speakers today have already mentioned that. Being able to access that surveillance, that, that control, that high level of control that employees are subject to. We have been fighting against that and we have been requesting for a while now to Amazon because according to the law we have the right to access that. The workers' representation has the right to know what is the rate they have to achieve. The workers are not aware of the, the target. And that is indeed a problem that is affecting Europe and the whole world. And we eh, must get together and unionize and set the goal of stopping those aggressive policies that exploit Yo, the workers. Lo que aquí con todos and y todas vosotros, also, I would like pues, to share mi vida, la poca, an anecdote when when we were in the dictatorship, it was common for us to be prosecuted when we were unionized. But I did not expect to see that recently. Recently, there was a strike for the collective bargaining to improve the collective bargaining in the Barcelona uh, region. And after a while, the company in, in Spain they, well, there was an investigation on, uh, on, uh, on corruption, and they used that to uh, sort of spy on the people who had participated in that strike. To, they investigated the people who were giving out information in their um, logistics hub in El Prat. So that day we were being uh, watched. Uh, well, it was not a surprise to me because it didn't mean anything to me. I didn't. There was. There were no consequences for me. Del periódico, pues, but una de it was in the news, que definía muy bien los espías, and someone los there was referring to the persona. people, um, una de to pelo the people blanco, being surveyed. Era jefe de they pinquete, they que era mentioned like sort of private terror. investigators, bueno, and actually one of those private y, investigators uh, vida, mentioned me. The I, I saw some of my characteristics España, being uh, reported, eh, eh, so I identified myself with the people they were. But again, uh, I want to mention that we are fairly protected by our legislation. The companies are uh, obliged to, um, they have to negotiate with the workers. And we see things like what happened with the pandemic. We did have to. Uh, report that the safety and hygienic measures of the company were not enough. When we reported that, the company didn't have any other choice but to apply some safety measures to protect the workers, to avoid that they were that they were exposed to the virus. So we work and we actually manage some changes. We managed to reduce the people 
Hay with coronavirus in the different entrar, logistics hubs, there are uh, heat cameras, the safety and healthy a committee managed to have the workers um, get PCRs and testing regularly. During the vaccination campaign, We've managed for Amazon to allow them free time for hours to go and get vaccinated, paid hours. And we managed to get that because we unionized and because we pressured them. We are also assessing the psychological and social risks produced by the high rate of work at the different centers. And in social media, we are very active, especially on Instagram. The track de Llobregat Logistics Hub posts every two weeks an interview but I have to say that we have to muffle that interview. We have to anonymize that interview of a worker. So every two other weeks, uh, we interview an employee and we ask them if they are happy, what do they think about the rate of work, about the productivity. And that initiative is actually being followed quite interestingly on Instagram because one thing is what Amazon presents and the other thing very differently is how the workers feel when they are treated like robots. Again, I want to thank that I was given this opportunity to share my experience. I hope it can be of use. We are working and we believe that Mr. Bezos, uh, well, what we, our goal is to make life very hard for yeah, Mr. Bezos. And we are doing everything that is on our hands to do that. Uh, despite my age, I am still fighting and we will keep trying and working for Amazon workers to be unionized and we want to put an end to paternalistic policies that Amazon uses. And, the, and Mr. Bezos needs to know that when workers are unionized and organized, we conquer our rights. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jose and Louis. I think uh, Jeff Bezos knows uh, that uh, if uh, the workers are unionized, they're stronger uh, and they're making his life uh, more difficult. That's perhaps also the reason why he tries to prevent uh, uh, workers in the United States and uh, in Europe to join a, a union. But uh, uh, and let's see indeed if with the same fighting spirit you are showing uh, us uh, from Spain, uh, we can learn the lessons for elsewhere in Europe too. And we have now uh, at, uh, some 20 minutes for a short uh, uh, question and answer. Uh, uh, and the first question I received was a question uh, more or less inspired by the story Oliver told uh, about the fact whether or not uh, 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 in the surveillance, uh, uh, Amazon is using illegal means, uh, which would lead to the question to uh, Alessandra. Um, uh, first, um, and do you uh, know of illegal surveillance in the United States? And has this been uh, uh, already addressed before? Uh, and uh, um, uh, uh, on the other hand, do you think, what do you think the response uh, uh, of Amazon uh, would be if they are indeed crossing some legal boundaries uh, in Europe because we have stronger privacy rules uh, than there is in the United States? So about legal and uh, illegal, can you say something uh, from your experience and your studies, Alessandro? Um, 
Um, I don't think I'm the best person to answer on the legal details. So maybe maybe people from trade unions will know will know will know better. It's it's also a mix of different jurisdictions. Uh, from the United States, at the very least, I want to say we we should keep an eye on what what's going to happen uh, in in Bessemer, Alabama, where there was a, a unionization drive a couple of months ago that was unsuccessful, unfortunately. But unions uh, are appealing. Um, and they're suing Amazon uh, because of the union busting techniques, which include spying on workers on the social media pages and all that will be illegal, of course. So there is allegations from that union specifically in that, in that case, for instance, in the States. Um, uh, and they want to possibly over, you know, re, re, rerun the, 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 the vote, of course, if they're successful. Um, in, in, in Europe, it's, it's uh, well, you know, uh, MPs and, and, and trade union, trade unionists will know bad, even better than me, but of course there is a mix of different, of different uh, uh, there's a patchwork of different, of different laws. So it really depends on the country and it really depends on what you mean by, um, you know, yeah, I, 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 don't know, I don't have a final answer. I want to say that in all these cases where, when Amazon has been found to be breaking the law, uh, they tend to have these, come, you know, these, this one answer where, where they say where they deny it and say we change this because we think it's it's best for our for our workers. So I would expect that if they are um, if, they, if if they, they were they were to be found to be uh, implementing illegal practices in terms of surveillance, that's going to be possibly the response, like denying it was illegal in the first place and, and presenting a possible positive change as, as something they decided because you know out of good heart. And uh, as far uh, uh, as you know, there is no, uh, so there are cases being brought to courts, but there is no court rulings uh, uh, showing ir uh, illegality. Uh, uh, um. I, I may be wrong. I don't think there is, there, there, are, there are rulings yet in specific in terms of surveillance at Amazon. I may be wrong though. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, and Oliver, do you know about uh, uh, court cases already? Uh, I'm actually sent a message to our Amazon guys. Uh, myself, I don't. Uh, my point is, I mean, Amazon has highly expensive lawyers, so they find basically arguments to say, obviously, is not the case. Uh, so when I uh, recall my speech, I said either they are wrong or uh legally wrong or they might not be legally wrong but they're morally wrong and we need to do something and i think that is really the point we have to check amazon is one of those uh, companies and they are probably one of the best in this regard using any loophole there is and going through it even uh widening the loophole i think that is a problem where we are basically uh, outplayed and especially you as legislator at the european level i mean they find things nobody has thought about or totally misinterpret it to the intention of what the legislators was and then go through this. I think that is our problem. And then uh, who is ready to take Amazon to court? I mean, even for a, a big trade union, if they want to go through all the instances and have expensive lawyers, that is a risk. Uh, so we, so again, I mean, we need basically your support at the European level to make sure uh, that we actually can do this. Because, I mean, if you have the money, you know what happens. Yeah. And you, you need big. Uh, you need to have a big lot of money mm. to face their lawyers uh, in court. That's what you're saying. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yo quería sobre el tema este decir algo. Nosotros aquí en Barcelona, eh, a raíz de que nos pusieron una cámara de vigilancia justo delante de la puerta donde están ubicadas las secciones sindicales de los sindicatos justo por donde tenían que entrar los trabajadores, la sección sindical de comisiones obreras interpusimos una denuncia ante la inspección del trabajo porque entendíamos que esa, con esa cámara justo donde estaba puesta pues eh, interfería en la interfered with the freedom of the workers of the uh, union workers to our surprise, the inspector who came to see the, what we were actually talking about said that the uh, camera was there just where the union workers were for pure surveillance. But in that passageway, precisely that leads to our offices, the union offices, there are cameras there. 
And we are now seeing with our legal experts in the union whether that camera located at that special place is actually going against the rights of our workers. Okay. Uh, that's that's interesting, uh, uh, Jose, because uh, 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 like I said, I, I think we also, of course, we have to uh, uh, um, uh, we have to see what kind of uh, measures we can take. But if you indeed are now fighting uh, uh, the fact that Amazon installed cameras to control who is entering your office or leaving your office, uh, uh, it would be interesting to see uh, uh, if you uh, can get a, a, a real clear uh, um, um, uh, um, outcome uh, of this uh, uh, case. Yes, uh, please. Uh, Elisabetta, you're asking for the floor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you. Uh, first of all, I really would like to thank all uh, the contributors because all the speakers because uh, really your uh, you know speeches were absolutely interesting to me and I have learned a lot of things. So thank you so much. I was particularly you know uh, struck by the the research by Alessandro and I, I really it was really very interesting. I would like to ask you first of all where did you do your research so in a particular warehouse or more in general on different warehouses second of all uh, it is really incredible how the system of surveillance uh, on the one side uh, controls uh, uh, you know uh, material things so i would say the the parcels uh, and the, the cars uh, but at the same time, the same uh, uh, surveillance methods uh, do control human beings. So as they were uh, basically things. So as they were, uh, of course, uh, really boxes themselves. So this is really astonishing. And so do you confirm that more or less the system is the same whether you are a parcel or you are a human being? And third of all, uh, I'd like to ask you if really the, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the control on the social distance that was put in place during the pandemic, uh, was treated as a rule of health and safety at work. So they were so, how can I say, uh, simplistic and I would say stupid to say that that system was, uh, you know, responsible to create a good health and safety environment. And then I have a question for Livia. Uh, so what do you think about the inter twinings uh, among uh, uh, sectorial collective bargaining because of course uh, there is uh, the logistic as far as uh, you know we, we know and then also the, the commercial sector telecommunication sector depending uh, on which type of work the different workers mm. are uh, uh, you know employed so what do you think because also in italy you you mentioned that uh, of course a collective uh, agreements are signed at the very minimum level but i'm asking uh, in which sectors if you can a little bit uh, uh, you know go into details about that thank you okay so, so first first alexandro and then uh, and then livia yeah, um, I'm gonna yes. I'm gonna try and, and be very quick. Uh, my research was was based initially. Uh, it has been based mostly in Piacenza uh, in Italy. It's it's the the site of the biggest uh, fulfillment center and the oldest fulfillment center in Italy, and happens to be my hometown. Um, so I started there because I have literally old classmates who work there. Um, so, but then I have expanded to other work, uh, uh, fulfillment centers in in Italy and also uh, in other countries, especially in the states um, uh, and. Uh, I've also visited, um, you know, corporate events, 
uh, where Amazon presents new technology they're going to introduce um, in the future. So it, it's not it's it's not it's not only based on on interviews with workers, but also analysis of the um, technological infrastructure, like the patents, and also the corporate culture, so corporate events and stuff like that. So it's it's a bit of a it's a broader. Uh, uh, it's off, hopefully, it's going to be a broader book than just uh, talk, just you know talk, talking about the, the, the workers' experience. Uh, I think it's an interesting, of course, it's an interesting metaphor to think that the workers are also boxes, or they're treated the same as as commodities. Um, I want to say that's that's certainly true. Uh, this is something that Livia was point, was pointing out before the fact that there is uh, we're going back to, or also, also Jose was pointing that out. But we're going back to to to, to uh, sort of an early industrial capitalism where uh, there is this masses of workers that are seen as disposable um, and they just, uh, you know, the turnover is very high there, they enter and exit the workplace very quickly in, in a matter of weeks or months, they're subject to this like despotic regime uh, and also, also the, the supervisors are in charge of, you know, enforcing the rhythms and punishing people rather than organizing technically the warehouse, so very similar to, you know, the, the early days of, you know, the the, the, um, the of industrial capitalism or post World War II industrial capitalism in in Europe, for instance. Um, but I want I want to say that workers are also treated. Both workers and commodities are turned into information that can be managed. Um, so because if you, if you if you imagine the barcode as the main tool that's that's used to identify things, places in the warehouse, and also workers. Um, so the, the 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 algorithmic systems that run the warehouse uh, treat both. Uh, the warehouse itself, the stuff that's stored in the warehouse, and the workers as as information that can be managed. Um, so I think that's a that's another possible metaphor we, you can use in a sense. Um, and then social distancing. I know that in some places, uh, it, it it workers have reported the use of social distancing distance, distancing measures as yet another uh, form of control and discipline. So like some people would be uh, uh, writ written up because they are they're not keeping social distancing. Um, so it's been used to avoid, you know, prevent people from just chatting in the aisles of the warehouse, um, you know, for political reasons. I know these people have reported that. Um, I, I want to say it's, it's again, like it's, it's, it's a poor substitute to other health and safety measures that Amazon has uh, has been very, at the very least, very slow to introduce uh, in its warehouses. Uh, in, in around Toronto, in Toronto, in the last few weeks, there has been, I think, three major fulfillment centers that have been shut down by public health. Uh, because of the continuous um, outbreaks of uh, COVID in those workplaces. So I think social distancing, the enforced, the technological enforcing of social distancing is a typical Amazon, Amazonian technological fix that doesn't really solve uh, the problem of health and safety in those places. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, and then Livia, can you uh, answer the question Elisabetta asked you? Yeah, sure. So, uh, well, Amazon is not the first case where uh, different uh, uh, trade unions or different federations within the same family co the same family coexist. So, uh, that shouldn't be a major issue, even though it adds, of course, to the complexity of union organizing. Um, but, but of course, it's a new business model. It's a new uh, sector, if you want, so it, it challenges a bit the, the the boundaries between the different federations. But we we work together. That's not the major problem. What is the major problem is the fact that they want to stick to the minimum. So um, and, and not, this also links back to the previous question. Uh, Amazon may not be uh, in, you know they are very good lawyers, so they may not be uh, breaching rules but they will just do the minimum they, they can. And that is where uh, that's, this is where comes the problem with collective bargaining. The problem with collective bargaining in Italy, for instance, is not uh, about the different sector because I think there is just one, there is just Piacenza, the warehouse of Piacenza that is in the commerce, all the rest is uh, transport and logistics. They apply the national level CBA but they do not want to, first of all, monitor the implementation jointly with the unions, which is something that normally companies do. Um, they, uh, as I said earlier, they put every obstacle to election of social reps, safety reps, and so. And third, they don't want to negotiate the second level collective bargaining agreement, which is the agreement where all the uh, issues related to productivity, working time, uh, performance, so all the 
the more detailed uh, issues are are uh, are, uh, are bargained. So that's that's the, the big problem, not the fact that there are different unions coexist. In Italy, there is also a third category of union uh, there. It's the precarious workers. So it's three different federations. But this is not the main obstacle. The main obstacle is the fact that they refuse to they refuse to talk and they refuse to negotiate. Uh, so they say we apply the we apply the national level agreement that that's it, but that's not enough. There is also another case where they push a limit. Just as an example, uh, you have in Italy you have uh, uh, so there can be exemptions to the limit of agency uh, temporary agency workers that a company can hire. Uh, these limits can be um, hired. Uh, if uh, workers, uh, for instance, workers with disabilities or workers in protected categories are hired, and they do, they hire as many of these workers as possible so that they have exemption on um, on, on the number of agency workers. So this is uh, it, it's it's really immoral, as as uh, uh, Oliver was saying, and this is where they push everything to the limit. They are not necessarily breaching the law because laws are not yet. Uh, um, other way to catch up, for instance, on algorithm and so on, on data protection and so on. So we need to speed up our legislation uh, work to uh, indeed bring this uh, uh, indeed into ordinary labor law. Um, uh, uh, thank you for this and thank you to all the speakers. Uh, and before handing and the, the the words to Pedro Marquez, who is our vice president, who's going to make some concluding remarks, I'm just going to ask uh, one last question to Jose and Luis uh, uh, from his perspective. Um, what would your message be to um, trade unions and uh, workers? in, for instance, Portugal or in the Netherlands, where Amazon is now opening up. Uh, um, um, what would your message be uh, for this new uh, um, uh, uh, shining opportunities they are like sketching to the, to the Portuguese or the Dutch public? What would, you be, what would your recipe be uh, for effective trade union uh, uh, operating uh, in in my member states, Jose Luis. What's what, what's your uh, uh, final message, please? I don't have any silver bullets, but I think that mainly, if the workers show interest to organize themselves and to become part of a union, this is the path we followed here. When Amazon opened up here in Spain, the workers from these warehouses, seeing the precarious conditions they were submitted to, there was a group of workers who decided to approach the unions and to get organized and fight for their rights. And that is what the workers of your country and the workers of Portugal should do. I know it's difficult. Because Amazon's policy is to hire very young people. Sometimes it's even their first job and they don't have a union culture as such. This is what we're seeing here in Spain. Although we are progressing, there's no class awareness to get organized. I think that's the main thing the workers to be aware that if they want to conquer their rights, they have to get organized and they have to approach, as I said, the unions, because this is their tool, the way workers have to fight against these practices, which Mr. Bessers is using worldwide. So to make people aware, they have to get organized. They have to be part of a union to improve our rights. Thank you, uh, Jose Luis. And also thank you for the fact that the fact that it's difficult didn't stop you for uh, uh, being active. Uh, and that's, I think, also an important uh, uh, message. And uh, then for the final remarks, Pedro. 
Pedro Marquez, our uh, vice president of the SD group. Uh, can I give the floor to you? Thank um, you. Agnes. Any final remarks? Thank you. Uh, I hope you can see me now, Agnes. Yes, great. Uh, thank you to you all. It was great and fascinating to follow the, the debate. Uh, it's a great example of when we go back to the ground and some of you might know I am coming back to the social dimension and to social policy after almost a decade working in, in macroeconomics. But I really love to come back to the ground and come back to social policy and to labor policy because we can make a difference in direct, directly in people's lives. What we have witnessed today is the result of concrete research on the ground, but also the work of the trade unions making a difference in the very complex platform economy. And this is something that is at the core of our group of the social and democrats priorities. Um, the social dimension of Europe, we are fighting for it, but we are fighting for it in a very concrete manner, which is to, 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 to take care, to take in account the social consequences of the transitions. Normally, we are almost always talking about the green transition, but today we were talking about the social consequences of the digital transition. And we have concrete examples here at the table, very significant ones from the beginning, from Alessandro to the end, to Jose Luis on the, on the positive way how the trade unions could make a difference in Barcelona, in Spain. And this is what we have to spread around in Europe, but not just not just, I would say, relying on national uh, 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 on national national initiative by the trade unions. We do need to do to make a difference at the European level. And what came up to my mind through this discussion was the fact that we have already dealt with this kind of platforms, with this kind of giants, digital giants, when we put forward the legislation on competition policy. Because if we don't get to legislate in a very tough manner, as it was said my, more than once by Livia, by everybody, sometimes they are, I would say, in the, in, the, in, the, in the borders of the law, in the fringes of the law. They are exploiting the law to the limit. So that means that we need strong European law. And that's what we really count now. You know that it was a priority by our group in, in, the, in the December resolution by the Parliament. It is a priority on the Commission Action Plan that was presented just a few months ago. And now, as we have been saying also with our Commissioner, uh, Nicola Schmidt, it's time to deliver, it's time to implement. And one of the priorities is clearly the platform uh, work legislation. We expect a proposal by the Commission and we will be strong from the side of the Parliament and certainly we can count on you and we will count on you to help us uh, 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 reinforce that, that proposal uh, when it comes from the Commission. As co-legislators, we expect to have a strong role in that legislation and to have a good legislation to enforce decent labor rights uh, in the platform economy. And the same with the right to disconnect, which is part of it, of course. It was incredible, the examples that Alessandro brought here today about how they exploit to the limits this kind of big brother in, in, the, in the workers' lives. It's, imp it's impressive and it needs, obviously, to be, to be taken in account when we legislate at the European level. As I said, social dimension of Europe is a, is a priority for us. We are now in the phase in which we want to implement, we want to deliver on the principles, on the priorities that were set. And as somebody was saying, uh, I think it was Jose Luis, uh, we wouldn't expect at this time in, in the second decade, or in the third decade of the 21st century to, to be discussing the type of issues that we were discussing in the 20th century. But it's true. It's true. And it's also an opportunity to the trade unions because, yes, these young workers from the, the, the economy of services, from the service economy, they need to realize that they need to organize through trade unions, through collective bargaining. They need their labor rights being defended. It's not through individual labor relations. It has to be through collective bargaining, through collective negotiations. So I think there's an opportunity for, uh, for labor relations, for the trade union, certainly, but we do need strong European legislation. And we as a group, 
we pledge to be uh, champions of that of that uh, of that uh, process uh, when we have the proposals by the European Commission. We have our commissioner preparing that legislation, but you certainly can count on us to to deliver to deliver as co-legislators. It will be a priority for us. Thank you so much for the incredible discussion, Agnes. It was great that you could organize with the working group such a lively debate with so many interesting examples. And let us proceed. Let us proceed to 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 create decent labor relations for this for for these citizens of the platform workers. Thank you so much. Thank you, Agnes. Thank you all. Okay, thank you, Pedro. Thank you to all the speakers. Uh, and as Oliver uh, uh, already said, it's not done yet uh, with Amazon. Uh, tomorrow we're going to visit their head office in uh, Brussels. Uh, and uh, although they were afraid uh, uh, to uh, accept the invitation of the AMPLE uh, uh, Committee uh, of the European Parliament, uh, uh, we are going to talk about labor conditions in the, uh, uh, in the European Parliament on Thursday. So we are not finished uh, yet, but I think uh, we have with your contributions a very good overview uh, where to start and where to uh, fight. So thank you for the inspiration uh, of you all. Thank you for the, to the speakers. Thank you to the audience. Uh, and we will keep in touch uh, because even if though Bezos wouldn't like it, uh, we will be active on Amazon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.